In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Have you ever attended a family reunion or a big event where people are gathering and having a good time? There might be music or games or some kind of entertainment. But in my experience, no matter what else is going on, there is always one constant. Anybody have any idea what that is? Food, <laughs> right. Whoever said food is right. <laughs> it's food. It doesn't matter whether we're celebrating Christmas, Thanksgiving, birthdays, anniversaries, or people moving in or moving away. There always seems to be food. There's something special about gathering around a table and sharing food or a meal. It's no surprise, therefore, that Jesus' uh, food was a huge part of his ministry. On one occasion, he fed 5,000 people. On another occasion, he fed 4,000 people. And he often ate with those whom most people considered outcasts. Today's gospel provides us instructions on four important points concerning the resurrection of Jesus and this resurrection appearance. First, the ancient world believed in ghosts. Jesus calls on the disciples to use their senses to prove that he is not a ghost. He says, peace be with you, calling on their hearing. He says, look at me, calling on their sight. And finally, he says, touch me, calling on their tactile engagement. Then he showed them his hands and his feet so that there was no doubt that this person was absolutely Jesus in his resurrected body, doing things like passing through locked doors that no other human being would have been capable of doing. The second proof that Jesus offered to them was that he asked for food. Ghosts don't eat or digest food. Jesus ate the broiled fish in their presence without the food simply passing through him as he had done passing through the door. This was further proof that he was who he said he was and was able to do that which he said he could do. Jesus gave them proof in different forms so that they could believe. People, even today, have said that there is no bodily resurrection, and some even say that the resurrection is a metaphor. Listen to what the, Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians, which most scholars say was written about A.D. 54 or within 20 to 25 years after the death of Jesus. To put that dating into perspective, think of 9-11 of 2001. We're now roughly 23 years from the date of that event, and it would be as if someone today who was alive on 9-11 were writing an account of that event. Because there are many people still alive who witnessed the tragedy that day, it would be very hard to change the story in any dramatic fashion. That will become less true in further generations. There are people around the world today already trying to deny or rewrite the horrific acts of the Holocaust in Nazi Germany and the concentration camps. So let's listen to the words of Paul from the 15th chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one thing, and that of the earthly is another. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a physical body, there's also a spiritual body. Paul tells us that without faith in this reality, our faith is futile and the Christian faith cannot exist. And this has been affirmed for millennia through the Apostles' Creed. Polycarp, a pupil of the Apostle John, 
also Bishop of Smyrna, one of the early bishops of the church, and recognized as one of the combatants of early heresies, said, Whoever perverts the sayings of the Lord for his own desires and says that there is neither resurrection or judgment, such a one is the firstborn of Satan. Let us therefore leave the foolishness of this false teaching of the crowd and turn back to the word that was delivered to us in the beginning. The third proof is that Jesus engages them in the study of the scriptures, and he tells them about how the law of Moses, the words of the prophets, and the words of the psalm were fulfilled in him, and that scripture said that he would suffer, be killed, and rise from the dead. In this process, he opened their minds to understand the scripture. The fourth proof is that Jesus proclaims God's blessing. Jesus said, thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This makes it clear that it has always been God's intention for things to happen just as they did. Jesus was to suffer, die, and then be the means of salvation or the means through which God and humanity would be reconciled for all who would believe. Jesus makes it clear to his disciples that they have been witnesses of this marvelous event and that they, as witnesses, have the responsibility for sharing the message of God's salvation throughout the whole world. As Christians, that is our charge as well. We are to tell others about Jesus, not only with our words, but more importantly, by our lives. In order for us to do this, we must know the story about Jesus and how he is the fulfillment of God's plan. I often say you can't give away what you don't have. To tell the story, you need to know the story. The disciples knew the scripture, but they had trouble putting it together until Jesus opened their minds. They knew pieces and parts, but Jesus put it all together for them and then opened their minds to understand. How might Jesus open our minds today to understand? Let's go back to the importance of food. In the pericope just before our gospel reading today, two followers were walking from Jerusalem, and the risen Lord joined them on the road to Emmaus. They didn't recognize Jesus. They thought he was a stranger. They had been talking about all the events of the previous few days, about the unjust trial of Jesus and his brutal crucifixion. Jesus asked them what they were talking about. They were shocked that someone in the area did not know what had happened because apparently it was the talk of Jerusalem. They told him the whole story, including how the women had found the tomb empty and how they had seen a vision of angels who said that Jesus was alive. As they drew near to the village where they were going, they encouraged Jesus to stay with them because it was getting late. He accepted their invitation, and while they were sitting at table, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and instantly their eyes were opened, and they recognized Jesus, whereupon he vanished from their sight. Just as Jesus was revealed to them in the breaking of the bread, we have the opportunity to have Jesus revealed to us in every Eucharistic meal as we break the bread at this sacred table. Jesus is present to us through his body and blood in the bread and the wine. Through the sacraments of his holy altar, Jesus is present to us. In receiving the holy sacrament, we have the opportunity to have our eyes open to seeing and knowing Jesus in our midst. Through the sacrament of Eucharist, he feeds us and nourishes us in ways that we cannot possibly understand. This is part of the sacred mystery. There's no way that we can understand because we're not God. 
I go back to a phrase that one of my favorite seminary professors used frequently. Would you really want to worship a God that fit between your ears? When we are fed, we are not fed for our benefit alone. We are nourished in order to be equipped to be his witnesses to the world. The entire book of Acts tells us how Jesus' disciples carried his message to the world. And although the book of Acts, in its written form, ends at chapter 28, we are still part of that ongoing story, often referred to as the 29th chapter of Acts. We, as disciples, are still doing our part to tell others about Jesus' gift and the fulfillment of God's plan for our lives and for those in the world. Part of the challenge for us in this 21st century, in an age that thinks it knows so much more than the early church, is to believe in Jesus and accept the peace and gifts that he offers without having the benefit of his coming through a locked door, standing in the midst of us and saying, peace be with you. When we study Holy Scripture and come to this table to be nourished, we are giving ourselves the opportunity to experience the risen Christ. I'd like to challenge you to be open to the possibility of seeing and experiencing the risen Lord Jesus Christ during this week ahead. Embrace him on the journey and see where he may be leading you. If you do, Your life will never be the same again. Amen.